Hello, hello, Helsinki. It's so great to be back at Slush. And I think this year is a very special Slush. It's not just because the world has changed a lot in the last 12 months, but I think, you know, if we look in the past, we've always looked into Silicon Valley as the kind of perfect ecosystem to start a company and a role model. And I think fast forward, it has really changed a lot because we found our own DNA in Europe to build great startup companies. And many of those startups actually that really make a truly global mark. And we have many US investors now that are going to Europe, like Sequoia, General Catalyst, Lightspeed, they all opened offices. So Europe is really hot. And uh, But what does it really take to build a global category leader out of Europe? So I'm super excited to discuss this today with an amazing group of people. Eleonor, founder of Pigment, Jochen, founder of Flix, and Markus, founder of both. So big welcome, and thanks for being with us today. Great to be here. <laughs> Eleonora, let's, let's jump right in. Uh, last year I was sitting here with Tavid, who actually transitioned from being founder of WISE to become a venture capitalist. You did the opposite four, four years ago, so you were with Index and then decided to start Pigment. What drove you to become a founder? What motivated you? So first of all, I have to say that being a VC, if you want to become a founder, is probably the best school on earth, <laughs> because you see what great looks like. You know, when I was at Index, I got the, the opportunity to actually meet incredible founders uh, that are around me today. And uh, I have to say that this is really how you understand what great looks like and what ambition can look like. And the reason why I wanted to become a founder, I think it's, it's you know, it came from a very, very young age, but I really wanted to have an impact on millions of users in the world. And I wanted to have an impact, I think, also beyond the company. And I think if you manage to build a global leader in a category, you can, you can also have a say outside mm -hmm. the core topic of your company. So obviously, you create mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of jobs. But also, you know, with Pigment, for instance, we try to have a, an impact on global warming by explaining to our customers that they should really care about decreasing their carbon footprint. And you can really you know, think also about other topics, such as parity, for instance, in a company, yeah. et cetera. So I really, really think. That's also what I want to get out of Pigment, is how to obviously fund like something very big and very competitive, but also have an impact outside the core topic of what we do at Pigment. Very cool, great story. And let's maybe talk a little bit about the cluster. So you were seeing the London ecosystem as a VC and many clusters, but you decided to start the company in Paris. How does Paris compare to other clusters like Helsinki, Stockholm, Berlin, London? And why did you choose to go back to Paris? I so can actually, guess from your accent, but uh, it's a beautiful city. But. <laughs> yeah, so uh, actually, well, uh, obviously, uh, France is my hometown. And uh, the, the reason why we, we came to Paris, so uh, my co-founder is actually the co-founder and CTO of Criteo. Mm -hmm. Criteo was one of the first su success in Paris, one of the first unicorns that actually helped the Paris ecosystem to create like dozens of unicorns afterwards. And what we knew with Pigment, Pigment is a planning company, so we are a B2B planning software. And we knew that one of the core asset we would have with Romain was actually our engineering team. And we had some incredible engineers that we could put together actually mm -hmm. in our headquarter. So it was very natural for us to create a very, very big hub in Paris because we had incredible talents in hand to create this global leader. Yeah, very cool. Marcus, uh, you're the founder of Bolt, which is, I think, currently the fastest growing mobility company globally. So you're in life in 45 countries, more than 100 million customers. You started it when you were 19 in 2013. Mm -hmm. Take us back to 2013. What person would I have met? How was Marcus in his early days? And what drove you to, to start Bold? Ever as long as I can remember, I've always had the dream that with technology, you can make the world a lot better place. I've always been very optimistic about it. So when I was a teenager, I learned to code. I was uh, building websites uh, for small companies in Estonia. Mm -hmm. I built a small uh, app for, for our school for educational purposes and so on. Um, so actually, when I was 19 and I was in high school, I just couldn't even wait to uh, finish school. I already wanted to get building. So while everybody else was studying for exams, I started to actually go on the streets of, of Tallinn, sign up taxi drivers one by one and build the app. So uh, I was just eager to get going as soon as I could. How does it feel like attracting taxi drivers in a time where Uber already raised, I think, 500 million or a billion? And you're like going on the street saying, hi, do you want to be on my app? Hi. Uh, actually, yeah. actually <laughs> when work? I was starting, they were still a small limousine company in the US. So, yeah. so back then, we didn't even consider them as competition at all. Yeah. So it was about six months in that they started raising massive amounts of funding. Uh -huh. uh, and that, of course, made things very difficult for us because yeah. you're a 19-year-old kid from Estonia, no experience, no connections, mm -hmm. nothing really. Uh, and then you go against this company that became the best funded technology company of all time. Yeah. They raised more than $25 billion. Yeah. So uh, it became very obvious that you cannot outspend them. Yeah. You, you cannot compete in the same sector uh, unless yeah. you're doing something really right. 
So from day one, we understood we're going, we'll have to be 10 times more efficient at least. And even that is not enough. Yeah. Because still to this day, we've raised 10 times less funding. Yeah. Uh, so it really, as cliche, cliche as it sounds, it comes down to the culture. So how yeah. do you get the right people who are really high performing, really high on cost efficiency? Yeah. That's the only way you can even survive. It's table stakes yeah. now. That's great. I think efficiency is something, especially in these times of the market, we'll touch down on that a little bit later, which is a disciplined approach, I guess. Uh, very exciting to go a little deeper. But I think one thing I would love to touch down on, you were 19 when you started mm -hmm. right out of high school. You still decided to go to university, I think, for mm -hmm. two, three semesters. Mm -hmm. How did it feel then to drop out and make this decision to be bold and, 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 and say, OK, I, I do this full time now. I, I dropped my academic career. My advice, actually, for everybody who has this question of sort of academia versus startups is that you can actually run both in parallel for quite yeah. a while. So as I mentioned, I started both in high school, uh, and then I went to university to study computer science. And I only dropped out in the second semester once we already had 10 employees. So yeah. actually, I de-risked the situation quite a bit. It yeah. wasn't like I decided I'm not going to go to uni. I actually did that yeah. as, well, as well as you can next to a startup. <laughs> but then by the time we had 10 employees and a lot of traction, it was very obvious that this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, mm -hmm. but I can always go back to uni and study more if I want to. Yeah. Will you go back to uni at some point in time, or is it too late now? <laughs> I'm still missing my, my math and physics lessons, but uh, no, probably not anytime soon. Nice. Well, let's see. <laughs> Jochen, actually, we met in 2011 when I was doing an internship in BCG, and Jochen was my mentor. He was a great mentor. He was doing his PhD back then. I think, actually, he was working already on the plan starting Flexbus. <laughs> but uh, that's one story. Another story is... This little toy here, uh, which is a Greyhound bus. So when I was three years old, my mother brought it to me from the US. And it was my favorite toy. And I think Greyhound is something interesting because it's kind of one of the biggest brands in the US. And it's kind of a symbol of national identity, I would even say. And somehow a year ago, this guy with Flixbus acquired Greyhound. So what the hell happened in the last year, 10 years since we met? Maybe you can give us a two, three minute version of Flixbus and, yeah. and what you've built. Yeah, no, no, happy to. And I'm not sure if I made too much of an impact on your career by mentoring you back then, but um, <laughs> still great to, to, to be on, on stage jointly. I mean, we've, I, I also dropped out of academia, to be fair. I already had finished my university and, and um, had started a PhD, but figured, similar like you, this is a once-in-a-lifetime chance, and you either jump or you don't. And if you, for us, it was always like, if we don't try to do this, we may regret this for the rest of our lives. And mm -hmm. back then, everybody thought we were crazy to do this. There was this market um, deregulation going on in Germany for, for many, many years, almost 80 years. It was not allowed to run yeah. bus services between German cities. And then the government decided, hey, we're going to change this. And we've seen this opportunity to come. And we felt, hey, this is something where we can build something new, build a new business, build something that has a real impact on people's lives, and also bring technology in a real world product. And it's very visible, obviously, what we're doing yeah. um, together. And we kind of found this so intriguing that we said, look, we need to try this out. Um, and thankfully, we've decided for the entrepreneurial journey um, and not for the academia um, in this case. Um, yeah. And I mean, fast forward 10 years, we've built this out of Germany, expanded across Europe. We're in 40 countries and I'm, it's, I'm very sad 40, to say we're not zero. in Finland. Wow, so it's the, the biggest bus mobility company globally now. Yeah, but we're not in Finland yet, um, yeah. so we, we, still, we still need to expand here. That's one of the very few European countries. Um, but then... I think, again, coming back to efficiency, we also had all these big competitors. It was the corporates that had much more money, they had experience in the space. Yeah. Everybody thought you were not going to make it because they will put buses, money, people on, on this market and you'll lose. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, I think, again, totally agree with what you said, Marcus, it comes down to you need this team who brings that absolute passion to build a product, to be more passionate around the customer, to build this business yeah. and to create efficiencies and also through technology. Yeah. And I'll, just to give you an, an anecdote, We've had one competitor, two corporates who actually joined forces to, to be um, in competition with us. They spent more money on consultants before they even <laughs> built the team than we needed to launch the first routes. Uh, it's just crazy. It's a bit massive difference. And I think this uh, is, I think, what, what we can bring as startups, as founders to the table to rethink how businesses are being built uh, and really build global companies out of this. Uh, that's interesting because actually the liberalization of the market was the trigger to start the company. And then the race was on. I think there were 10 companies in Germany. You won the market. On the other side, it has then turned into kind of a monopoly. I think there are different arguments on what a monopoly is. If, if I look at the bus market, you have maybe 90% share. If you look at the mobility market, overall not. What are the advantages or disadvantages of such a market situation for the consumers and for you as a business? Because, I mean, if you look at some of the most innovative companies globally, they're monopolies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, but they, that makes them profitable so they can really spend money on things that make the world a little better or technology and not like competition. 
How about FlexBus or what situation mm. do you see there? I mean, for, for us, it's, if you just look at the bus segment, it certainly feels like we're having very high market shares. And we're mm -hmm. like, if, if a few years in um, into market expansion, we always target a 50% plus to really be very relevant yeah. and build the best and most dense network. Um, at the same time, we continue to have competition. Every customer has a choice of either taking a train, taking a flight in some cases, taking his or her own car, carpooling, whatever. There's yeah. always substitutes. And this is ultimately for us also the big opportunity to really get people out of using cars and yeah. using collective mobility. That's why we're also, we don't really see the state rail folks, for example, as competition. It's more like you jointly build an inventory that's better for customers to make you even more independent from owning yeah. your car and just yeah. relying on also mid and long distance on services like ours. Yeah. Cool. Let's talk a little bit about scaling because that's the actual topic uh, of, of, of this panel. Eleonore, you know, when starting a SaaS company, there are a lot of choices you need to make in the early days on what you want to focus on. Whether you want to win a market first, a country, a certain vertical, whether you want to expand in Europe, whether you want to expand in US. I think you grow 6x in five months and you're pretty big in the US and you're still very early, like three years old as a company. Um, what were your major trade-offs in the beginning and, and how are you dealing with it right now? Yes, also, so, given the market situation, you know, we discussed about efficiency, capital constraints, especially going into maybe a two-year or three-year recession. Like, how do you deal, deal with that kind of... Yeah, so we are lucky, obviously, to, to, to have raised uh, sufficiently to actually uh, be free of going wherever we wanted. But the reality is... Uh, Uh, so we are a SaaS company, we are the only SaaS company in the panel, and when you want to create a global sales leader, the, you have no choice but to go to the US, right? The US is going to be your number one market mm -hmm. for many reasons, and uh, obviously you can go early, you can go later. The reality is for us, uh, we knew that timing was now. Uh, we want to create a very, very large, probably one of the largest SaaS business uh, in the world, uh, the modern version of SAP, $200 billion plus if we can. And in order to do that, um, we knew that what could be key for us could, have, could be to have actually some key logos, some key lighthouse customers that would be able to talk about us and rave about us, not only in Europe, but in the US. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a completely virtuous cycle, actually, because when, um, when you start in the US, so don't get me wrong, it's very hard because the first customers, we had to actually find them from Europe. Mm -hmm. um, when you start there and you start having your first key logos there, mm -hmm. then it means that you can hire people that understand that your product is great. Mm -hmm. And as you know, like probably one of the other things for a SaaS company in the US is to mm -hmm. put together an amazing team. Because a, a SaaS, for instance, sales leader in a, in a great, you know, mm -hmm. successful company, there is no reason for him to join a European company yeah. if you haven't signed any good customer out there. He will yeah. be like, how am I going to crack the market? You know, how am I going to make my quota and help my team be successful? So it was critical for us to show actually that as we wanted to create a fantastic sales team day one, to be able to prove to them that our product was already superior mm -hmm. and that we had raving fans. Yeah. So literally, Two months after we launched, we straight went to the US, and in a few months, we signed Figma, we signed Carta, Brex, Gong, DBT Labs, mm -hmm. and their finance teams, their RevOps teams, are now raving fine, raving ambassadors. Mm -hmm. And it's fantastic because it's the best network effect you can have. Now we can have the CFO of Figma coming to a marketing event, to a customer event, and saying, look, you know, this is why I'm using pigment every day. Mm -hmm. Right now is a crisis. This is how I deal with uncertainty with pigment. This is how I do my scenario planning. And it's the most powerful thing you can do. And I have to say, especially for us, we are enterprise SaaS, which is also very different from mm -hmm. when you sell to SMB, um, it's a lot of word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So when you get to your first crazy big customers, they have an incredible network. Mm -hmm. And it means that not only they will bring to you your next customers and they will help you unlock certain markets, yeah. Silicon Valley Forest, New York, etc., mm -hmm. but they will also help you perhaps find candidates mm -hmm. for your company. Yeah. And so it's a completely virtuous cycle. And I have to say, I, not, I, I can't regret at all the choice because it's really helpful today and we have already 40% already of the business in the US wow. with a yeah. very small team out there. We have 40 people out there right now. Yeah. So. How do you deal with it? Is it like uh, the main team is in Paris, like product development and also kind of strategy, but the distribution is more local, so that, that will be sales marketing in the, in the US than on the ground? Exactly. Yeah. So what is important, though, is that when you sell, in, no matter what the geography, but yeah. it's even more true in the US, you need your customer 
is not only buying the product, is buying the entire experience. Yeah. Because what they want is at the end, a quick time to value and have a product that works. It's not only having a product, it's really having yeah. something that they can deal with on a daily basis. So it means that you cannot only have A's, for instance, or BDRs uh, on, on, on the ground. You really need to have a proper experience sell from BDR, so top of funnel, to professional services, customer experience, support people, product specialist that can really help your customer on a daily basis. Because imagine your product doesn't work and it's like 4 a.m. in the morning in France. Yeah. You need people to be able to help straight away yeah. because I don't know a customer is stuck on whatever formula, etc. Yeah. So it's, it's critical to have a fully functioning service and you cannot bet on a country if you don't put uh, this full set in place. Cool, that's an exciting story because there are many SaaS companies that focus on one market first. If you take Presonio, Hanoi has also been on stage several times at Slash that was focusing on Germany for a long time and is now kind of winning Europe. And then there are a lot of competitors in the US. So I guess different ways to, to scale there in SaaS. Markus Jochen, uh, if we look at your companies, what impresses me most is that you've built global category leaders in a category that I thought was by definition hyper-local, which is mobility, because you mentioned, you know, the ecosystem is very local and, and there are local competitors. And the second thing we already touched down on, you were basically competing about Goliaths that were well better financed. In your case, it was Uber being like incredibly strong finance. And in your case, you mentioned already Deutsche Bahn, Megabus. If you had to mention one thing, what has been the key ingredient to compete successfully or the secret sauce to, to outcompete all those companies in such a short time? In our case, clearly, it was just a very high performance uh, as a culture. Mm -hmm. So we realized again from day one that they have 100 times more funding than us. Yeah. Hundreds okay. times. I mean, imagine that. You're building a company <laughs> against yeah. 100 yeah, times better financing. There's 100 times yeah. better financing. So it, yeah. it was really brutal. Uh, but mm -hmm. that meant that we had to be extremely smart with how we were spending our resources. Mm -hmm. uh, and that meant we had to be very frugal with the people we hired and get them with the right mindset. Mm -hmm. And that's still the, the core value we carry in the company today. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd actually have two, two comments that are quite different. Uh, what was our thesis? Why we were successful as well? well one is that uh, I think many VCs and, and companies were making the mistake that they thought you had to go into US and Western Europe. Mm -hmm. I do agree that SaaS is a very different business. There it makes a lot of sense. But specifically in our case, we ran the numbers and it was very clear. You can build a multi-billion dollar company just in emerging markets or just in Central Eastern Europe. And that's something that many, uh, many investors missed. And that's yeah. why it was very hard for us to fundraise in the first couple of years. But then suddenly we were able to show them five years later that, hey, we're doing this billions of turnover in these markets. Yeah. And then they realized that they actually missed this opportunity. And the other thing, coming back to culture, is that it's very different to build a SaaS business or to build an operational business like we have. Yeah. So you need to be strong on both sides. On one hand, you have extremely sophisticated software running at extremely high scale. We have millions of trips happening every day. You need to build out the maps, payments, all of that to orchestrate it. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, you also have these physical offline operations. Yeah. We have offices in 45 countries. So how do you maintain that culture of frugality and this really high intensity operations mm -hmm. To, coupled with this technology stack. And yeah. that's extremely hard to do. Yeah. Very few companies are able to do both well. Yeah. So that's what really separates us from, from most others in this space. Yeah. That's incredible because um, I think one key takeaway for me for all the founders here is, you know, yesterday I think Doug Leono was saying like starting a company is a 15, 20 year long game. And I think in the last two years it has exaggerated a little bit that just everything needed to go so fast. People were thinking about raising the next round and kind of... Uh, being successful within two years, but it really shows that it's a very, very, very long-term game and strategy that you need to be play to be successful. Maybe one quick follow-on question on that before we go to Jochen. Um, we, we just discussed, you know, you did an amazing funding round beginning of the year when markets were still like, okay, let's burn it within one year or be, be the fastest. Uh, did anything change in the last 12 months regarding your strategy? Because in the beginning you were hyper-efficient and like, I, I guess that's also what made you successful to compete. But then you also, in the mobility space, have to land grab and, I guess, be aggressive. And then, again, you have a market like this where you maybe have to switch again to your hyper-efficiency. So is Bolt such an agile company that you can switch as fast between those two? So in, in this industry, there's, first of all, two very powerful fundamental forces at play. So one is network effects. As you yeah. mentioned, it's a very hyper-local business, uh, but those apply to the city. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how big you are in the US. What matters is, yeah. do you have drivers here in Helsinki right when I open the app, yeah. getting there in a few minutes? So that's the hyper-local bit. But then on the other hand, of course, you need to invest tens, hundreds of millions into R&D to build out all of this technology to actually yeah. orchestrate all of these trips. 
So on one hand, you need to be very strong hyper-locally, but you also need sufficient global scale. Mm -hmm. But then coming back to what that means for fundraising was that the first four years for us, again, were, were brutal. We were only able to raise 2 million euros locally. So effectively, we were bootstrapping the company the first four years, yeah. while our competitors were raising billions. <laughs> and now over the last year, in 2021, we raised more than a billion euros in funding. Yeah. So our funding basically went vertical. Um, and what we did, we were very aggressively investing that, but of course now times have changed and mm -hmm. we're actually going back into what was the norm for us. Yeah. Being very frugal, being close to break even, yeah. and we can be profitable when we want to. Yeah. But this is a very different environment. And mm -hmm. we actually welcome that a lot. Yeah. Because generally, we've seen that we, we're great at operating this type of business. We're very cost efficient there. We haven't necessarily been the best fundraisers. Yeah. So we think actually this environment where companies are getting valued not based on the story they tell, but actually based on their underlying economics, mm -hmm. we think this is a great era for us over the next five yeah. years. Reminds me a little bit of Mickey with Vault, who has also been competing in such a competitive space and then being so efficient by then, mm. also managing to scale. Uh, Jochen, how about Flixbus? What was the secret sauce to, in such a short time, outcompete so many markets and so yeah. many larger uh, Goliaths? I mean, it, I, would, I would agree with a lot of what you said. And I think we've had this extreme situation of the pandemic just recently um, on our end where the business effectively disappeared within a few weeks. And I think that, again, was the point where <clears throat> the team has been excelling at what we think is the secret sauce, which is entrepreneurial spirit, passion, and speed. Um, so they all felt like, hey, we're in this together. Let's find a solution. Very solution-oriented, very passionate about how do we solve this? And very detail-oriented around, let's be analytical, how do we take these decisions? Where can we put capacity? Where the, where's the demand, et cetera, to be really agile mm -hmm. in, in ramping down the business, but also ramping it back up when the, when the demand came back. Yeah. And I think this was coming back to what you said again. Um, the environment that we had through the pandemic, funding-wise, what investors were looking at, obviously, in hindsight, wasn't super healthy for, for many companies if you build for the long term. Because I think it, it truly matters that you build for a healthy unit economics, for, for a healthy business. And this is how we've built our business for many, many years. So we were always um, frugal around where do we spend our money? What's the speed of expansion? We didn't overdo it. But at the same time, I think had to find the right balance between where we're going next, how fast can we go? What's the organization actually capable of managing in terms of the speed of expansion? And this is something where... And, and that's why I think we're now much stronger than even before the pandemic. So we've done our homework... Yeah invested into automation efficiency also through the pandemic, but at the same time invested into tools to be even more flexible, data-driven, and how do we take decisions. Yeah. And in our market, and that's true for any mobility company, the secret, the part that you need to get right, the holy grail is supply and demand match. If you're really good at that, this is what's driving profits ultimately. Yeah. And I think this is where we even improved through the situation. And that's something where our team has been deeply impressive to me in which speed, with which passion and like analytical sort of ambition, they've been managing that situation. And that, this comes down to entrepreneurial spirit. And I think that's, that's great to see to have this on the team. Um, and I think this is what can differentiate you from the large corporates, the big companies, the big competitors. Because at some point, if you have too much funding too early, if you're too big anyways, if you're a corporate, you just get slow and lazy. And this is what you need to also culturally manage out of your organization yeah. from day one and like for the next 10, 20, 15 years. Yeah. Let's switch a little bit to the investment side because you're all both founders that are successful but also pretty active business angels. How has Europe changed in the last 10 years as an ecosystem and what are our strengths and weaknesses compared to other clusters such as Silicon Valley and other regions? Whoever wants to take that one. It's changed massively. So from my experience, again, starting in 2013 as a 19-year-old in Estonia, it was impossible to raise more than a million euros. No, yeah. Nobody locally even had any, any source of funding more than that. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the second problem was that if there was any funding, it was mostly in London. Those were the only funds that had really any, any capable funding to invest. Um, but the issue for us was we, we tried. We, we mm -hmm. talked to every VC in London, dozens and dozens of them, and every yeah. single one turned us down. Yeah. So, so that's why we were forced to bootstrap the first four years. But now, looking at 2021, it was completely different. So even in tiny Estonia, every other week we were seeing companies raise seed rounds, you know, a million, two, three, four million. Mm. It's, it's completely a different world now, and mm. capital is so much more available, even in the current climate for early stage companies. Mm. And I think net-net, that's still a great thing. Mm -hmm. Many more people are trying. Of course, many will fail, mm -hmm. but I think the outcome is going to be a net positive. There's going to be some great outcomes for, yeah. for everyone. What I love as well is that a uh, couple of things is that now that we have a lot of global leaders uh, in, from Europe, the government is changing a lot the laws mm. in every country. 
uh, we are also thinking globally day one because you know our country is too small so usually a lot of founders I mean Finland itself we were discussing yesterday Rob with Peter Fenton from Benchmark that yeah. just in Finland you know you have so many billion dollar companies because they think day one about being global and, and building a company for billions of, uh, of users if possible and not only that but obviously a lot of US capital has come here and thanks to COVID now that we can all work remote it means that for a company for instance like Pigment as I was describing yeah. it's so easy to be global it's so easy so right now you know you don't even need a team out there that's why it was so cheap for us to go to the US we had zero people on the ground mm. and it's also thanks I, I think to the full cloud infrastructure both for B2C and B2B business mm. that you don't need as much money as before to actually create a company because you don't have to create everything yeah. from scratch so yeah. all in all we are now very lucky I think in the European ecosystem and there is such also mm -hmm. a fraternity uh, across, uh, across country that you know makes it very helpful to to go from one country to the next so. uh, I, d I agree I think it's great that also sort of founders start reinvesting into companies early on sort of pass on their experience you, we, we continue to see former colleagues of ours starting new businesses and like bringing that connectivity that network already and I mean just being here in Helsinki it's incredible to see how much of an ecosystem is here in, in yeah. Finland and if you can just sort of think about copy pasting this to so many more places in Europe I think we have a true chance to to move um, Europe forward yeah. and it still feels like it's early days. Ten years ago there was very little, yeah. now there's a little bit and I think another ten years fast forward in, in that development, yeah. I think we'll, we'll, we're on the brink of having a, a very good future here. Well, that's great news, so it seems like it has never been a better time to be a founder and uh, I think the DNA we have in Europe maybe being a little more capital efficient and a little more conservative sometimes but at the same time getting more ambition level also, you know, from, from the US also, I mean, if we look at Slash, uh, a few of the speakers that we have, seems like uh, the ecosystem is really, really, really gaining momentum. Let's maybe quickly switch to one or two more personal questions. Uh, we talked a lot about building a business, but Eleonor, you also run a family business on the side because you got twins two years ago and you're also fathers and, and moms. And I know Jochen has uh, three girls, so that could be a whole panel on its own how to deal with that. But how does a typical day look like in the life of Eleonor? Crespo with twins and, and building pigment at the time. Easy. <laughs> no, Easy. <it's> That's <laughs> a good answer. That's enough. I think. <laughs> no, actually, I did a panel about that yesterday that you can probably watch uh, about how to be a parent and a founder at the same time. But really, uh, what I try to do is spend time with the kids every day, travel as little as possible. Um, I try to carve out three hours a day for my kids to make sure that I can see them a bit in the morning, a bit in the mm. evening. This type of events I do very rarely, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, because also, you know, I'm running the company so I have to be, uh, to be very focused on that, but also because I really want to, to spend time with my family, right? So I would really give you an advice here yeah, to, to spend as much time as possible because life is short and it also helps us be more focused because every day you have to think about the top three things you can do at the company to be impactful. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's a 24-7 it's adventure. So it's a, it's a, I would say that apart from these three hours, I just work continuously. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's, that's my life. But it's amazing. It's possible, right? We're always discussing yeah. trade-offs, but uh, I think we have to work hard on, on just making, building the environment that it's possible to grow a family and start a company at the same time, even though it will be tough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was saying yesterday that uh, when you build a global leader anyway, yeah. it's, uh, it's across a period of 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Yeah. So, of course, you're going to have kids and, uh, and you have to deal yeah. with your life with that, right? So, it's, uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's a clear decision. There is no good time to have kids, no good time to found a company. So, yeah. just do the do at the same time. And There's it always a good time for both. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Maybe one last question and I would direct that to Jochen because we're discussing a lot high level. Oh, now is the best time to start a company and the markets are difficult so best startups are born out of crisis and it's easy to say that as a VC when you don't have to operate and do this but Jochen I think you've went through a quite, quite hard time during COVID yeah. so maybe you can give us some motivation or an example why a bad crisis can really be a great opportunity for an yeah. entrepreneur if you get it the right way. I mean I, I guess all of us who are here having that entrepreneurial mindset and will we're all optimists and I think this is what carried us through this crisis where for, within a few days our business disappeared completely and we were like shocked and scared of are we going to survive this and this was about survival yeah. a lot um, and ultimately we figured hey this is there's a massive chance in this crisis because everybody in our market is suffering 
And if we're just better than everybody else and, and, and just improve and like survive somehow, we'll have a massive advantage. And then at some point, I mean, you, you have the Greyhound bus there, this opportunity was there and we felt like, hey, this is this unique moment in time, again, a bit like 10 years ago when we started the business and we can't let this opportunity right. pass. And this optimism and this de determination just gave us that, that energy to pull through. And I think this is something that we translated into the team with that clear vision, built a strong narrative of, hey, we're going to make it through. We're, we're all in one boat slash bus. Yeah. I'm going to make it through. And I think, as, as you said, I think this is a good example on how you can use a crisis for your advantage. And we're stronger than ever. We continue to grow. If you sort of see our revenue curve, it's been dropping, but we're on that same path like we've been in 2019. Yeah. Um, and, and we're stronger than ever. Um, and I think this is, as I said, never, I know this has been stressed a lot, but never waste a good crisis. It, this is true. I think you can learn a lot from these situations yeah. and come out much stronger than, than you moved in. What a great finish. Never waste a good crisis. The capital is there. The VCs are there. You guys are here to, to really build your ideas. Take a 10, 15 year horizon. And uh, I think it has never been a better time to build a great company. So thanks so much. Thanks so much to you guys for the panel. Thank you too. Bye.